Hey everybody, welcome back to another Throat Punch Lunch. I've got a great bunch of segments lined up for you this week. And yes, we are finally getting back to a little bit of normality after Hurricane Irma. I want to thank everybody for their thoughts and prayers over the last few weeks. It has been a race. It has been a rat race. It has been crazy, but we are back to some semblance of normality. And so here we go back into another episode of Throat Punch Lunch. My contributors have done a great job as always. So let's get to what they have lined up for you. Hi, this is Ambi from Board Game Blitz. And this is Strategically Thematic, a segment where I talk about theme in different strategic games. This time I'm talking about container. Container is an economic board game about the manufacturing and shipping of goods. Players are producing and shipping goods to a remote island where the players need to buy the goods for their island. Although the theme might be a boring one, the mechanics make the game extremely thematic. In the game, you're playing multiple separate parts, like the producers, the shippers, and the purchasers. It may be somewhat weird thematically managing all of these jobs, but you can choose to focus more on one type, since they all can get you money. And since the jobs are actually all separate, you can't just produce and sell to yourself. You have to sell the goods you produce to another player who stores it in their harbor, and they sell it to another player who ships it. Because there are different types of goods, you can choose which goods to have, and depending on what other players choose, one player could get a monopoly on the goods. But one really neat mechanism of the game is that players set their own prices for all their goods. So when someone has a monopoly on a good, you can join in on the market and set your prices lower so that all the other players will then buy from you. But you still need to make sure you set your prices high enough to make a profit, since it costs money to produce and acquire the goods. Another thing that's thematic is that you only get money when other people actually purchase the goods. You don't get anything for producing the goods until someone else buys it, and they only get money when someone else buys it to put it on their ship and you don't get anything for shipping until you go to the island and other players buy the goods from you. This makes the economy very thematic. If everyone sets prices too high, no one will buy goods, no one will make money, and everything will stall. The final points at the end of the game depend on what containers each player has. Each player is trying to stock their island with certain goods, so the container points translate into different amounts of points. Since each player values each type of good differently, and you only know how you value the goods, you can't foresee the demand for the goods you're producing and shipping. Other players may not want to buy anything from you if you happen to produce something they don't need. Another interesting mechanic is that once someone ships goods to the island, all the players simultaneously bid in order to purchase all the goods from the ship. So if your island really needs those goods, you're willing to bid more than other players, but you don't know how much the other players want those goods. Also, the player who shipped the goods can match the highest bid in order to get it for their own island, but then they actually have to pay the money and don't make a profit on the shipment. Container is a highly interactive and challenging game. The flexibility of being able to set your own prices as well as the auction on the island is really interesting, and it's very thematic how the end prices naturally end up being a lot higher than the manufacturing cost. Thanks for watching Board Game Blitz. What are your favorite themes in board games? Let me know in the comments. This is Rory Candy from Epic Gaming Night, and this is Roll With The Punches, where we talk about randomness in games and how it can make a game exciting, and also how to twist luck into your favor. Today we're gonna to be talking about a game where you're trapped on an island trying to explore and figure out what's going on in the story. Today we're talking about Seventh Continent. In Seventh Continent, players are trying to explore and survive the Seventh Continent. 
as they're going around exploring different locations on the map. Um, one of the interesting things in this that is random is that there can be random events that you can end up triggering as you go around. Um, you can explore different locations on your turn. You can go over and check out these rocky cliffs or maybe we want to explore the map in this direction. So we decide we're going to go here. Um, so sometimes you have to do different skill checks to be able to get through. This one we don't need any successes so we don't have to discard any cards. This is your action deck. You're trying to minimize your use of the action deck itself because if you go all the way through this and then you have to flip over the discard pile and then you're going through that if you end up getting curse cards you'll end up losing the game. So you're trying to be very strategic on how much you use these action cards. So let's say we try to explore north here and we get a little story thing here. Your calf is itching uncomfortably. Examining it you notice a nasty red spot. You must have been bitten by a spider and you can only hope that it has not laid eggs under your skin. What? Um, then only the active player is forced to take the following action. And then you take a different action test here. If you have any things that help with little um, health actions, or let's see what the keyword of this one is, the cure and heal action, then you can use those. Um, sometimes you'll get different items that can help you with different things. Um, but basically we need two successes to um, have the good outcome on here. So let's say we take um, goodness, two successes, that could be rough. Maybe we'll take three cards to try to make sure we get a success here. So then you're gonna be looking at the stars on the corner here. So whenever you have a half star, it doesn't actually count as a star unless it lines up properly. So like these two stars don't line up. So we have one star here, and then there's another star on this one, but there is stars that meet together. So we actually have three stars all together. So we, we beat that, and it says here, the little wound seems to be healed nicely. If you failed this, it would have ended up saying, the eggs are under your skin, certainly not possible. Banish this card. So what does that mean? There was not really any real negative effects, it just banishes this. Maybe something's gonna call back to those spider bites that happened back at the beginning. But, um, Whenever you do one of these actions, you are allowed to take and keep one of these cards. So do I wanna get an herbal mixture and try to work on creating these? These are different ideas that go in your hand and give you new items that you can create. And on future turns, you can um, discard from your little exhaustion deck here and be able to create these different items. And depending on if you have different resource types, you'll have to discard less cards. So the more you build stuff, the more you're wearing yourself out. Then you can also try to like stop and like create fire and get food and cook it to be able to take cards from the discard pile and put it back into the deck. All sorts of exciting things here in Seventh Continent and lots of randomness you can mitigate by getting the correct items and trying to mitigate the randomness that you have on these different tests. So Seventh Continent has several different interesting moments of randomness in it. I really enjoy the exploration cards that are different so it makes when you replay the game things can be in different places and things like that and you're never quite sure what you're going to uncover where there's different events and things that trigger as you're exploring around the map and then also the actions that you take in the game as you have this action card deck that you're trying to not go through very fast and you're trying to figure out ways to mitigate running through the action card deck but then also when you're doing the different challenges and things like that making sure you have the the right stars on there. You can kind of mitigate that a little bit if you build the correct items when you're doing specific things and also like if you're building items where you need specific um, components making sure you don't have to discard fast through that by making sure you're on a resource type on the um, different map there making sure that you don't have to discard cards as fast. If you discard through the whole thing and then end up drawing a skull card as you're going back through it then everybody loses the game so it's this whole thing of trying to make sure when you can rest to try to get cards out of your discard pile and put them back in that deck and try to like make sure you're surviving on this um, this mysterious seventh continent that you're on. It's very exciting trying to like go through and the story in this game. I haven't gotten very far in the scenario yet, but I just thought it was really exciting the mechanics of this game and how it works. I'm definitely excited to learn more about seventh continent and how to mitigate and make that randomness work in my favor. So this has been Roll With The Punches and we'll see you next time. Hey everyone, I'm Mandy and welcome to another episode of Confessions of a Board Game Reviewer. Today, we're taking a look at board games that had lots of hype, really excited, but fell really flat with your group. So, I have to confess, I was super excited to buy Cosmic Encounters because everyone said it was so good, and well, my group hated it. Let's just say it's no longer on the shelf. Let's see what the other board game reviewers had to confess. We heard a lot 
lot of good things at D Marker, and we're excited to find a copy at our friendly local gaming store. But then we actually played it, and we didn't like the randomness, so we got rid of it. You know, the guy who worked on, on Legacy Games, that, that huge innovation in the industry. Oh, Risk Legacy, Pandemic Legacy. Well, he's got this, his own game out now. It's gonna be huge. Disappointment. I've been waiting for almost a year to play this game, and when I finally played it, unfortunately, it fell flat. That game is Scythe. I know everybody loves this game, but in my group, unfortunately, Tokaido didn't make it. So there you have it. Those are board games that got lots of hype, but didn't really go over well with our game groups. Why don't you go down in the comments below and tell us what hyped up games you had and didn't go over well with your game group. Join us next episode as us game reviewers talk about maybe there's a review that we've done in the past that we may change our mind about it now. Until then. Hey, what's up? It's Jay, and it's time to talk about your flair. On 15 Pieces of Flair, I'm going to show you guys some ways to spruce up that game room. Cry Havoc is one of my favorite games of all time. The asymmetric factions are all exciting and well balanced. And the combat resolution is my favorite of any game I've ever played. So today I made some Cry Havoc flair, and I'm going to show you guys how I made it. Let's check it out. For this project, I used a wood canvas 8 inches by 24 inches. Masking tape, black, blue, yellow, green, red, and gray spray paint. Four silhouette stencils cut from shelf liner, paper for masking, fine and ultra fine point permanent markers, and clear matte spray paint. First, I painted the canvas completely black, making sure to get around all the edges. Then, I used the tape to mask off the outside and make sections to paint different colors. I used the paper and tape to make some flaps. Then, I painted each section a different color in no particular order. Once I got each section painted, I would flip the paper around to cover the already painted sections. Then, I removed all the paper and tape. From there, I placed all of the silhouette stencils. Then, I used the masking tape to mask off the rest of the canvas that I didn't want painted. I then painted all the silhouettes gray and removed the stencils and masking tape. Once that was completely dry, I used the permanent markers and some detail photos I made on Photoshop to draw in all the details on each figure. I then finished the piece by spraying it with matte clear spray paint. Boom! There you have it. A quick and easy way to add some flair to your game room. I don't know what Cry Havoc Faction's my favorite, but I know it's a toss up between the humans, the machines, the pilgrims, or the trogs. But they're all neck and neck. Anyways, if you guys have any suggestions on games or ideas you'd like me to make in some flair, leave them in the comments below or go to my Facebook page, Peak Your Interest. Don't forget, 15 pieces of flares, the bare minimum. Some people choose to do more, and we encourage that. Have fun, everybody. Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm here to bring you another episode of Solo Thrash, a Mare Thrash gaming for those of us who like to play alone. This week I'm going to be covering a game in which you play a team of superheroes battling intense enemies in crazy environments. In other words, I'm talking about Sentinels of the Multiverse. In Sentinels of the Multiverse, you play as one or more heroes who are up against one of a number of possible supervillains. In this case, I went with Baron Blade, who's kind of the standard. To make things even more fun, you are all playing an environment that has a turn of its own and that can be very challenging. In this case, Insula Primalis is a volcanic island with dinosaurs. It's pretty dangerous. Gameplay itself is pretty simple. You just follow the instructions on the back of the rulebook. Villains get a turn, they go first, then the heroes each get a turn, 
and then the environment gets a say in the matter. Beyond that, you just follow the instructions on the cards, although these can actually get pretty complicated. You have to keep track of a lot of modifiers, especially if you play a lot of cards that increase or reduce damage under certain circumstances. If at least one hero remains alive to defeat the supervillain, you win. If the villain and his dastardly minions bring you down, you'll have to regroup and fight another day. There are a lot of hero combinations and powers to experiment with, so part of the fun of the game is regrouping after a defeat and seeing if you can come up with a more powerful team strategy. Although I primarily play Sentinel solo, I do like to control at least two heroes at once so, I can so that I can exploit any synergy between hero decks. I love Sentinels for a number of reasons. First of all, it's a very replayable game. You have a ton of variability because you can try different heroes with different combinations against different villains in different environments. So there are just endless ways for you to test out your hero's powers, to find powers that complement each other, and to take on really intense challenges when you're ready for that within the game. I also love that Sentinels has an ongoing storyline. Not only are you playing a game about comic book characters, but there is actually a comic book that is available so you can read about the adventures of those characters. And I love that the game mirrors this sort of overall story arc that your characters go through. To me, that just makes the game that much more special because I have so much more story to really get into. With all of that said, I do have one warning about Sentinels of the Multiverse. There is one major complaint that people have about the game, and it's not a problem that I have, but it's a legit issue, which is that the game is very finicky. Um, you have to do a whole lot of keeping track of damage modifiers, whether, you know, if somebody's, somebody's nemesis, they do extra damage to each other, or, you know, certain cards can nullify certain types of damage on a given turn. So maybe you can do fire damage, but you can't do projectile damage. And, you know, um, sometimes damage can be temporarily increased throughout the whole turn because of the environment card that came up. Or there's, there's basically a lot to keep track of. And I don't really mind that, but if you do, um, this may not be a game that you want, at least not as a hard copy. The good news is if you do want to play it anyway, which I recommend, there's a great app for it that will do all the bookkeeping for you. I prefer the analog feel, but there's a lot of ways for you to access this game if it's your sort of thing. So give Sentinels of the Multiverse a try, and happy gaming. Hey folks, welcome back to another Canvas segment. It's been so long since we've been able to do one of these. I really enjoy this segment. It's probably one of, the fa my, one of my favorite segments to create uh, for Throat Punch Lunch. Uh, because I get to see what other people are doing in the hobby, how they are making the board game hobby their own. And I really enjoy looking at that. I really enjoy highlighting it for all of you guys to check out. Well, today we're going to take a trip to Alberta, Canada, and visit a couple there named Sarah and Jesse Keeling. Uh, I received their story as an entry to the Zombicide Black Plague entry, how they got into board gaming. And I thought it was interesting how they kind of took a back door into the hobby. So let's get to their story and check it out. Sarah writes, our introduction into the hobby was back on the Xbox 360 when we downloaded a couple of arcade games, specifically Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne. We enjoyed playing these together, never very competitive, mind you, just having fun. From there, we heard about Catan. We were not very impressed with the flat cardboard hexes, so a few friends helped us create a beautiful board to play with family and friends. You see, we feel very crafty and we really enjoy upgrading our game components. Not being incredibly social people, we found our new hobby was a great way to interact with those around us. This has spread the love of games throughout our closest friends and given us more reason to stick around family events even longer. As our board game collection grew, the budget for video games shrunk. But now we enjoy spending more time at the table together than in front of the TV screens and tablets. So that is the Keeling's story. I just thought it was really interesting how they got into the board game hobby 
through video games, and specifically video games that were mimicking a board game that was already in existence. I just really thought that was interesting. It just kind of caught my interest, and so I wanted to share that with you guys. Don't look down on the video game industry. I know that uh, it seems unintuitive, but it could be the door that somebody walks through for the board game hobby. So without further ado, we're gonna get you to the rest of your Throat Punch lunch. We'll see you guys on the flip side. Hey everyone, this is Tim Jen at the Metal Meeple and this is the Budget Card Game Breakdown. So at Gen Con this year, I picked up a pastry picking card game from Game Right called Go Nuts for Donuts. Now this is a card game for two to six players, takes about 20 minutes, and if you're familiar with Sushi Go, it's the same publisher, and it's a very similar game, except the way you go about everything is totally different. You're basically trying to collect donuts, get sets of donuts, things like that. There's a lot of donuts that are worth points just by themselves. So what you're gonna do is, depending on the number of players, you're going to take out certain cards, uh, colors or whatever. In this case, I just kind of kept everything together. But you're gonna take one of these slot indicators here, and it's one through, there's seven of them, but you're only gonna put enough of uh, uh, in play for each player plus one. So in this case, we're playing a four player game. You simply just put a card into each slot, and then you're ready to begin. What you're gonna do is you're gonna, each player gets a card that represents each slot, so one, two, three, four, and five in this case. They're gonna choose which one they want, say they really want what's in donut slot one, because you can see here at the end of the game you get points for how many's in the set, and maybe they've already got some of these donut holes. So you're gonna select which donut you want, put the card face down. Each player is gonna make those selections as well, and then you simply reveal. And you start with what's in slot one. So in slot one, we have donut holes. Only one player has put a one out, so they're gonna receive that card. Then no one picked number two. No one, uh, two people picked number three because they wanted this, uh, this set bonus probably. But unfortunately, if two or more players select the same card, it is discarded and not given to anyone. And then this player who picked four would get this. This is a special card, it has little uh, stars at the, the corners and it basically just denotes a special action. Uh, this allows you to take any one card from the discard pile, but it is all worth negative two. There are cards in the, in the deck that allow you to cycle cards amongst players and such. No one gets number five, and then you simply just refill the deck basically. Everybody gets these cards back and you just do it again. You keep going until this deck runs out or, or essentially you can't fill up all five of these slots. It may not be completely ran out, but anyway, this is a super fun card game. I was pretty impressed by it. I thought it was just gonna be very like, I don't know, like lazy, I guess, <laughs> just because it's one of those games where you're just kind of throwing things around, but I get into it every time and it only takes about 15 minutes. It, I know the box says 20, but it, once you play one game, you play it two or three times, it's literally 10 to 15 minutes. It just goes bam, bam, bam. Once people know kind of what the cards do and they don't have to keep on reading them. Uh, anyway, I really enjoy it. It's, it's super fun. I like it probably slightly better than Sushi Go only because it's it's got some of those cards that are like one-offs. They allow you to dig through the discard pile or allow you to, to do different special actions. There's one that allow you to, everybody takes a card and pushes it to the left. Uh, and that's how you can get rid of those negative cards. So there's a lot of cool stuff going on here and uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying myself. I was pretty surprised by this one. I, I got it mostly because the cutesy artwork and I knew my wife and, and my family and stuff like that would like it. You know, it's definitely a family weight game. I'm not saying there's a ton of strategy in this but it is fun having that table talk where you're like I'm going after number two so you better select something different because I'm taking it anyway you slap your card down maybe you're lying maybe you're not it's got a lot of that cool stuff if people don't really get into that so much that table talk and that, that light-hearted threatening I guess uh, then maybe they won't like it so much you know if people are just kind of not talkative and they're just slapping cards down and stuff it's it's not as fun you have to go with that I think that's part of the spirit of the game so anyway I highly recommend in this one especially if you if if you or anyone you know likes sushi go it's similar enough to where you can you know easily get into it i mean not that it's hard anyway but uh you know as far as the people who would like that sort of game i think it would it would work really well with them so until next time if you have any questions by the way feel free to post them below Till next time keep on rocking and rolling dice Hey, 
hey, welcome to Throw Punch Lunch. My name is Bobby, and this is We'll Learn As We Go, where I'm going to talk to you about a game and how I would teach that particular game. This is the second part in a two-week video series where I'll be covering Eldritch Horror. Uh, just to clarify, I talked about Eldritch Horror in the last Throw Punch Lunch, and I talked generally about how I would teach the game. Uh, this week is just to elaborate on some of the things that I was talking about in the last video. Okay, so let's get down to the board and I'll show you what I was talking about. So here's the board of Elder Tour. Really pretty board, I really like this board. Um, I think maybe some people might think the map is a little washed out, but I think it looks nice and retro and fun. Um, so the first thing I would do is I would pull out a villain that we would pick probably together as a group. So here, for example, this Cthulhu villain, the reason why I would do that is there's some setup instructions, as well as here, there's some setup instructions here for the Mythos deck. Um, there's some villains that, well, there's some information about villains that'll show up. There's some special instructions, and probably most important, there's victory conditions on this, as well as where the Doom Track starts. Uh, I wouldn't cover too much about what the Doom Track means, just to let them know that the Doom Track running to zero means you lose the game. Also here, um, I'll quickly cover what an Omen Track is. The Omen Track kind of goes round and round and round. Different things happen at different points. Uh, I wouldn't cover these things too much, and I hardly ever cover the Mythos deck at all, because that's something that we could find out together as a group. The one thing that I do cover about the Omen Track is, one, um, what happens during the Surge part of the Mythos phase, Omen Track phase, and two, um, what happens when Gates come out. Um, so, um, if I don't really cover too much of the Mythos phase and the villains and things like that, what do I cover up? Well, I want players to pick their characters. And there's a lot of information on these character cards that I want people to talk about <clears throat> or people are interested in. Uh, a lot of information on the back, but not too much relevant to uh, what we need. There's some information about what happens when the investigator gets knocked out. Just cover that if an investigator does get knocked out. There's where the investigator starts. Most of the information that players will want is on the front, including the stats of their characters, the health and sanity of their characters, special abilities, things like that. So even if they don't know what that means yet, uh, show them those things, and then start with the stat part. What do I mean by that? Well, if they ask what the stat part means, tell them that you use those to do checks. And I would show them a few checks in the game, um, starting off with this shopping check here. Tell them that whenever you want to go shopping, um, you roll whatever number the influence on your card is. And I picked the politician here just because I happen to know that he has a really high influence. So, really low chance of me failing. Um, I have this little storage container with all these tokens. I'd recommend something like this so that all tokens remain kind of grouped together and you can pull them out with ease. I have some dice here that come with the game. Let's see if I can buy these bandages. And I have definitely succeeded. Look at all those successes. Um, I count up how many successes I have, match it to the cost. I have enough to buy this bandage here. After you talk about the shopping phase, um, and the shopping check, you could go over some other checks that aren't as intuitive. And as you do that, you could cover some of the cards and how they pop up. Um, when you talk about locations, I wouldn't talk too much about it, but I would talk about what you could find potentially at each location. So here, Rome, you could find things that improve uh, your willpower, which is your head number. Um, I would actually take them through a check here. So with this, you would pull one of these expiration location cards. Uh, so you pull this, let them know how to read a card. What do I mean by that? Well, these location cards have three divisions in it. So if you're in Rome, you might as well read the Rome part of the card. I would read it and it tells me to check with this number here. Hey, it tells me to do an influence check. Awesome. So I roll four dice and I definitely succeeded. And it tells me what happens if I succeed and when I fail. There are some other checks that aren't as intuitive. For example, um, these... Uh, expiration checks here, these are pretty complex. Um, there are kind of two checks on this card. First, there's a check to do when the card gets flipped over, and then if you pass, there's another check, and if you fail, there's another check. And then I would explain combat. Why would I explain combat last? Because combat, I think in this game, is not intuitive at all. You have to do a sanity check and then a health check, and you only fight the monster when you do the health check. So I don't think that's very intuitive at all, but I make sure I cover that. And you've already kind of covered what happens with the gates. 
uh, make a little monster cup. I use a uh, cup or sometimes I use the box top even though it has a really wide brim. If you want to, you could look inside, but I just kind of hold it like this and let players pick some monsters. Oh, one more rule to go over before uh, players start the game. I would make sure to tell the players what you can and can't do if you're in a city with a monster, like you can't rest and go shopping. Um, other than that, this game really is a we'll learn as we go game. Um, you should have explained what clues are as you were explaining the villain card and how to win. Um, and after you've explained all of that, quickly kind of go over your actions, including how traveling tokens work and such things like that. And then I would just start playing the game and answer questions as you go. There will be a lot of questions in this game. This game's a pretty long game, but with long games like this, I prefer a short rules explanation and then just get into the game and make the learning game a little longer. But people experience the learning game and people enjoy it. So that's how I would teach Eldritch Horror. Really fun game and now you've had two videos where I talk about how I would teach it. Hopefully that was helpful. My name is Bobby. Thanks for watching Throw Punch Lunch and I'll see you next time on We'll Learn As We Go. Bye! Hey folks, welcome back to another just Mystic segment. Uh, what I like to do on these segments is showcase games or components or uh, some other kind of accessory that just missed the mark of being really, really cool. You know, and for whatever reason, it could have missed the mark. I try to explain that. But here today, I'm going to talk about a game that I've actually already reviewed. It's this one right here, Goonies, the adventure card game. Now, if you're about my age, the Goonies was all about the bee's knees way back in the day. This was a cool movie that I really enjoyed watching, and uh, I just identified with the whole group of kids in, in one way or another, and I just enjoyed the movie so much. So when I heard that there was a game coming out about it, wow, I really was looking forward to giving it a try. Unfortunately, though, and you can watch my review for the specifics, this one absolutely fell flat for me and for the people that I played it with. Um, it just was too disconnected thematically, and the mechanics that were used while they were sound just didn't mesh really well with me, and it was not a fun experience. It was a huge letdown. And, you know, this one just missed it. For me, it really kind of just missed the entire target because this is such a thematically rich IP and they did it so much disservice by making a, a kind of a not fun game out of it. So uh, Goonies, the adventure card game, really just kind of missed the mark for me. There are a lot of people out there that really enjoy the game, so I don't want to down it so much that you completely turn a blind eye. But, you know, if you have the opportunity, give it a whirl. I didn't find it very good, but maybe you will. So go ahead and still give it a look if you want to, if you have the opportunity to. But for me, just missed the mark. Ahoy there, Throat Punchies. I'm Forrest from Bowers Game Corner back again for three reasons where I do something vaguely related to the number three. And today, it's Festivus because we're going to have an airing of grievances. I actually was talking about it with my game group, and I wanted to make a video about it. So I'm going to be talking about the three things that publishers do that really just annoy me or tweak with me, aside from the obvious things like, you know, making bad games and terrible rule sets. But these are three little things that don't actually hinder gameplay that still bug me when publishers do them. So first and foremost, I hate, I hate, hate, I loathe when a new expansion to a game I absolutely love comes out. For instance, Cities of Splendor here. You know what Cities of Splendor has? It has an amazing box insert. Everything has its own little place and its own compartment for you to put it in there for just the expansion stuff though, which means no one's going to use it. Ever. Because who wants two boxes on your shelf? Make the expansion be able to hold the base game and the original game. That's what Pandemic, I think, was on the brink did. That's what you need to do. And I hate when game companies do that. Oh, 
drives me nuts. Number two thing that really bugs me, and, and I'm going to give a very extreme example, is when there's too many bags, and bags, and bags, and bags, and there's bags, and there's bags everywhere, and I don't know what all the bags do. And I put stuff back into bags, and I'm just like, why is there still three extra bags? What did I do incorrect? And then the weirdness in me is like, well, I should probably figure out why there's an extra bag, or why there's three extra bags. Are these extra bags? I don't know, and it drives me crazy. But the most extreme example I've ever seen of this is this game right here called Brew in USA. It's a fun area control bidding game from Adam's Apple Games. But this this bag, this box, legitimately had over a hundred tiny bags. They individually wrapped every single bottle cap in this with a bag. Now, I'm sure that was probably for shipping purposes or choking hazards or something like that, some legal thing. But man, I hate. And you know what I'm talking about. When there's just a huge stack of bags left over, you're like, what do I do with these? Because I can't throw them away. You can't throw away bags. You never know when you need bags. Oh, but the last thing, without a doubt, the worst thing that game companies do that drives me absolutely nuts, especially as someone who has a lot of games, and I think people with a lot of games will definitely agree with that, is when there's way, way, way too big of a box for the game. So this right here is Mad Science Expo from AEG. Not a particularly great game in my personal opinion. i got a review of that one out, uh, coming out soon. But this is what you get in this game. This. This is a deck of cards. This is a deck of cards, and this is a box, and that's the stupid box insert. Are you... Girl, why do game companies feel the need to do this? Don't lie to me about what's in your game. Don't make me think it's a bigger game than it actually is, just so it has more shelf placement or appearance or something like that. Oh, that's the thing that drives me the most nuts. When, when I open a big box, I'm expecting, oh, I wonder what's going to be in this box. There's going to be something cool in here, and it's just... Oh, there's a deck of cards in this giant box. Oh, drives me nuts. But let me know in the comments below. What is something that game companies do to you that doesn't actually impact gameplay that drives you nuts? And if you're enjoying what I do, please be sure to click out my channel. As always, back to more Throat Punch of Goodness. Hi, welcome to Board Game Opinions. I'm Steve Rang. I'm Mark Windsor. And I'm Jonathan Hicks. And in this uh, month's Designer Spotlight, we're going to be talking about Uwe Rosenberg. And Uwe is known for quite a lot of games, generally he does heavy Euro games, but he has got the light games uh, as well. He straddles the gap, I think, between your heavy Euros and your family games really well. Um, and even with your the heavier, somewhat thinkier games, Partly because of the artwork, I think they're still appealing to family yeah. members. I know yeah. I certainly played things like Agricola, which you would think is more of the heavy euro. I played it with my son, and he plays it happily enough, so it does strike me. He doesn't get in the right artist because you have little funny little pictures going on on each individual on the boards and stuff. Yeah. Just to make it a bit more welcoming, I think, is the most important thing. Uh, you certainly prefer the heavy euro, and yeah, 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 I do like the thing, but I even think these lighter games have strategy, deep strategy, in some of the ones we talk about as well, even just the two player versions of games and so on have kind of a lot to think about and they're not just simple games. Yeah. No, I really like his two player games. Yeah, I mean something like obviously look at Patrick, so I assume that there's a lot more to that than you thought when you first think about it and that's yeah, the yeah. important thing. Um, well, one of the games uh, I've got in front of me is uh, Le Havre. Uh, in Le Havre you are um, effectively a, a, a working a port and you're collecting resources that have been shipped in, trading them in um, into better versions of themselves, so like you're smoking your fish or you're baking your clay into bricks and stuff, and then using that to buy buildings, using the buildings to make things even better, and then ship them off for money. End of the game, the most points wins. What do we think of uh -huh. It's a very well designed game. It's a little light on theme for me, I find it rather dry personally, <laughs> but it's very well designed, it's a very solid game. I've only ever played that on the app, so it's, okay. I won't say it's a, it's a physical sort of game, but agreed, I mean, it is essentially about shipping, so it doesn't need much more theme than that. I think, I think it's good moving. I think it's a hard game to do well at, and I think that's yes. true with quite a lot very, of games. Yeah, they're, they're all, often very tight, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, well, another tie game is Agricola, the tight worker placement game of being a medieval farmer, trying not to starve to death. Uh, I quite like it because it, you do kind of feel a bit like a farmer, and you do definitely feel like you're starving. Yeah. It is a brutal game that puts a lot of people off, why some people prefer Caverna, but 
Uh, this was the first one and they're both very similar and it just does what it does well You do feel like I'm getting sheep. I'm breeding cattle. I'm building my building and it's all fun to me I think if you do like this, there's just so much scope in it yeah. There's just so many cards and extra additions and expansions and stuff you can add to this um, Just to make it such a great game I think uh, although you do have to feed people this you do have to feed people in the half and it does seem to be an aspect of some of these games yeah. that You have to feed people Can You literally think well. your child's gonna, gonna die I think that's maybe the difference. Yeah. Feast of Odin. I own Agricola and Caverna as well, and I really like both of them actually. Again, as Mark said, a lot of people prefer Caverna, but I'm quite happy to play both of them. I think they're both great games, really enjoy them. Uh, and Caverna even more so than Agricola, you can play it with family members to a certain extent, you know, if they've played a few other games. Um, he, Uwe Rosenberg tends to do worker placement very well, I think, mm. uh, which is exemplified in uh, Agricola, which I think was one of the first games to really do, or at least make worker placement famous. Um, it was particularly well known for that one. Next top one. Uh, next game I'll talk about then is Patchwork. Uwe Rosenberg has actually done a number of two-player versions of his larger games. So there's a two-player version of Lahav, there's a two-player version of Agricola, and there's even a two-player version of Caverna that's just come out. Um, but Patchwork is a kind of standalone two-player game, which uh, you introduced this to me first, yeah, didn't yeah. you? And when I first played it, I was like, uh, I'm not sure about the theme on this one, but it's essentially you're playing Tetris. But I really got into it, and we played it, and we played it, and played it. And the more I play it, the more I like it. I think Absolutely, it's the it's number game. one abstract game on Board Game Geek. Oh, if you right. search by abstract, yeah, it's right yeah, up there. Okay, it's um, a great game. So if you like any of these games, you've played any of them, and want to try some others, pick a different one on the list, or pick other games that we've mentioned throughout the show. I've been Steve Rain. I've been Mark Windsor, and I'm Jonathan Hicks. Thanks, Thanks for watching. Welcome to another Throat Punch Lunch episode and yes today I have one here for all you history geeks out there, all the ones who are very good at knowing facts about historical figures or times or anything that happened in the past. For me, I'm more about the present and the future, you know, I'm, I'm more about what happens now and what's gonna happen as opposed to the past. History really isn't my strong subject. But this is a gateway game that I can get behind and this is definitely one you must have in your collection if you want to bring that history geek or nerd or whatever you want to call them, you know, that boffin who knows everything about past history into your gaming group. And that is Timeline. Timeline is a excellent history based card game. Now it doesn't matter which set you get really. I mean this is the science and discoveries version. I also have the inventions which is my preferred game of choice. I find this one to be the most fun but I also have British history which also goes down well because well obviously I live in Britain what do you expect but you can also get American history you can get music and cinema you can even get a Star Wars version you know I, I think there's even a Marvel version maybe I'm not entirely sure but there's various different editions of this and you can even combine the two I mean imagine trying to come up with when did this particular invention get made was it before or after the M25 was first introduced to Britain? And was this before or after the first dinosaur fossil was discovered in New England? I mean, there's all sorts of combinations you can do with this game and you can customize it to your heart's content. And chances are I would lose the game as well because this is one game that I struggle at because my history knowledge is, uh, shall we say, niche good. You know, that's kind of my shtick. Now, Timeline is a very simple card game where you have a selection of cards in your hand. There will be a date on the other side, but you will have them face up in front of you to say, right, M25 invention, or the introduction of penicillin, or the Battle of Hastings, or Stonehenge was built, whatever, whatever edition you've got. And then you will have a card in the middle that represents the first part of the timeline. And it could be, uh, you know, the compact disc was invented in, whatever, 1975. I don't know the actual date. But then you take it in turns to place one of your cards in that timeline to say whether it's before or after the one that's already there. And if you're right, it stays there. And if you're wrong, you draw another one from a deck. And you carry on in this fashion. The timeline gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And so it gets more and more difficult to slot your card in that timeline. Because you're thinking, 
was it after 1875? Yes, I think it was, but there's only five year gap. Was it after, was it after 1880? Was it 1875 to 1880 or was it after 1880? Oh, I don't know. And you get all these tough decisions. You try it, you either win or lose. You know, what does it matter? First person to get rid of all their cards is the winner, but it's a nice, light-hearted, very good educational game. If you've got those friends who are more into trivia games, you know, the ones who just like those WH Smith trivia cards or were always great at Trivial Pursuit or something, Here's a good little uh, modern equivalent that would be interesting to get them involved in, and I'm sure they would enjoy it just as well. But Timeline is guaranteed to get those friends of yours that are into history into board gaming, hands down. Great little gateway card game. So that's it for me. If you like what you hear, feel free to subscribe to the YouTube channel, the podcast, and my written reviews, or you can just check me out on the next Throat Punch Lunch episode. For now, Take care, and remember that these history games are still only games, and I'll see you on the next episode. Take care, everyone. So that just about wraps up another episode of Throat Punch Lunch. We thank you guys for taking the time to uh, check out the content that we've been creating. I want to give a big, huge shout out and thank you to all of my contributors who are remaining faithful to the cause, so to speak. Uh, So until next time, we'll see you guys on the flip side. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.